at Nightmare on Elm Street. Wow! So thank you so much for joining us. And who canceled? Well, it was the Five Nights at Freddy's people. Apparently, one there was supposed to be two of them, and one of them is getting in tomorrow. I guess you know, boss man didn't. No, one of them popped for COVID yesterday. So yeah, unfortunately. Is that what we say now popped for COVID. That's it. That's what my husband always said because he worked in transportation. And we'll keep our distance. <laughs> so well, I haven't seen her. <laughs> but yes, so, um, you know. Excellent. Well, I'm glad to be here. Is everyone happy to be here? And Woo! And Woo! So excited. A lot of people drove a long way. I met, I met almost half of my guests, actually. Yeah. Driven here from someplace else. So. Uh -huh. Thank you so, so much for joining us because, you know, this was not planned. It was very last minute, and I'm so grateful. And especially grateful because you weren't scheduled for a panel. And I know that it is. That's what? like the first time in a very long time that I haven't been scheduled for one. So I know even your manager didn't know because he's like, well, she doesn't plan. She's not going to do one tomorrow. I'm like, she's not scheduled for one tomorrow. I know. Yeah, and I was bummed, but, you know, it's cool because you're here now. Oh, my gosh, woman. Okay, so you, we've had talks before. So we have had so many talks, and I got more talks for you. I'm wearing my not Freddy socks. <laughs> They're just black and gray. I couldn't find any green and red ones, but I would have worn them if I did. If you so. know. <laughs> I need to go out to the vendors and look for some socks. they got to be out. Freddy socks. Okay, so, you know, I love you some Freddy, but I love your body of work in general. You're very complimentary. Um, it's all true. And you know, I I watch the obscure stuff. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about some obscure stuff. Oh, does the audience want to hear that's obscure? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Before there, you there's out. some really obscure. Last time you interviewed me, you brought up some obscure ones. Yes, last well, I'm going more obscure. Oh no. Okay, so another There's a reason they're obscure. No, there's not. <laughs> okay, so yes. that's this one is always usually means they're not very good. No. Okay, so this is a little off. stranger. Um, I'm gonna go back to my high school play. Oh my God, would that be great? <laughs> as a theater nerd, I would love that. But so, as a um, a fan of your co-star in this specific mm. project, I want to ask you about this for a while. Um, sleeping bag. Oh, yeah. With the late great John Dye. Yes, and I was actually just recently learned of his death. I, yeah, I, I think it was 2011 in I January. Know. I, very Lost sudden, him. very sudden. So John Dye was an actor, and he and I um, ran through the forest in Big Bear, California, with a, a giant pickup truck called Bigfoot, if anyone is a pickup fan. This was the start of the show, actually. They took such good care of the pickup truck. <laughs> and I remember they, um, you know, ZZ Top is one of my favorites, and I, I somehow got the part, we went up to Big Bear, California, and I just thought we were gonna shoot and then come home, and so I didn't really bring an, you know, an overnight bag. I remember we got on the bus to go up to the shooting location, and everyone has like, a suitcase and I'm like, are we spending the night there? And they're like, yeah, didn't you know that? I'm like, no. And so I ended up having to like wear the same clothes for three three days. But um that's what I remember. But actually shooting it was really, really fun. And I finally got to meet ZZ Top at the very last day, the very last hour we were there. And you know, they are superstars, so they kind of came out and shook our hand and then you know, went back into the limousine and drove away. What was the most challenging part about shooting that music video? Um, well, you know, it's at night in the, in the deep forest, and it was, uh, I think, the running here and there. I'm always running. I never have the proper <laughs> footwear. Running, you know, practically barefoot through, you know, lots of stick, you know, prickers and leaves and sticks and things like that. But um, I, that one was pretty painless, I have to say. You know, I, I didn't hurt myself, I didn't get injured, and and I thought the storyline was really sweet. And it's like a little girl, well, not a young woman, her grandmother reads her a bedtime story, and then, what's the plot? Like, I'm saving a bag of money or something? Or? Yeah, you're going to find a bag of money. Yeah, I'm going to find a bag of money, like we all do every day. <laughs> 
<laughs> go look for that bag of money under, under a tree stump. And then John dies there to help me. Yeah, it's like, kind of magical. Yeah, it's kind of a magical story. It is, you know, and then kind of is a Freddy adjacent with the whole dream. Yeah, the dream thing was very Freddy-ish. Yeah, the dream situations but, in there. And it's like, is that why they passed you? Because it was after. I bet it was. Right. Yeah, I bet it was. And I'm trying to think, um, I met Jennifer Rubin on that. Uh, because she was the girlfriend of the producer. Oh, okay. and, and yeah, and she, and that was way before we ever met on Nightmare on Elm Street. So I'm remembering that too in the trailer. I met Jennifer Rubin. So. And last but not least, John Guy was one of my favorite actors of the '80s. Oh. Um, a lot, you know, he always made me laugh. He did some really good comedies, and the, um, he kind of was the king of the. Um, Pilots, because he did a bunch of pilots. Oh, right. and a bunch of no, he was very, that he a lot. So do you, yeah, he did. And so do you have any specific, like, memories for working with, with him? I mean, uh, working with him was, we, we had a lot of laughs. I couldn't tell you what we laughed about, but, you know, it, we, we got, a, we had a lot of fun. And, and then I remember after, we did go out to have breakfast one time at this restaurant where we had these famous sandwiches called Monte Cristo's. Do you have those here? And I'd never had a Monte Cristo sandwich. It's like you gotta have a sandwich. And so, and so he he made me order it, and it was fantastic. It's probably the last time I even had a Monte Cristo sandwich. Do you know how another one? And there, there's a famous restaurant. It was like a brunch place on Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles that served them. It was the only place that did. So when you went there, you had to order that. Kind of like when you're in Atlanta, you have to have like that special dish, you know. In fact, chicken and waffles, or whatever it is here that everybody eats. Yeah, you can get a Monte Cristo pretty much at any diner. You can any greasy spoon. We can get them in Chicago. Oh, or really? With the mm -hmm. strawberry jam and it all. Yeah, in Indianapolis, right, and that. And I'm yeah. sure the Metro up there has some on their menu too. Yeah. So we must get a Monte Cristo in honor of. <laughs> Nobody knows what that sandwich is from. It's delicious. My, 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 like a deep fried sandwich. My ex-husband had to educate me on the Monte Cristo too. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I never had it. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's my yeah. That's, that's, a, that's the only thing I really remember. My memory is good. It also was. So stop asking, asking me questions about forty years ago, please. You <laughs> said it was a three-day shoot, so that was very quick. Also, yeah, mine had even just been two days, but yeah, it was just two full nights and then part of a day. Amazing, yeah. Amazing. It was fun. Okay, I'll stop asking to do things. Do we have any audience questions? Actually, the one other thing is that. <laughs> Because I'm from Oklahoma, and um, you know, you can see all the stars in Oklahoma at night, like a normal place. But having lived in LA for a couple of years, when they took us to the mountains, we saw the stars again. And I remember thinking, of, like, oh, you have to actually leave town to see the stars in LA. And uh, yeah, it was kind of a sad realization that I hadn't seen the stars in so many years. So, uh oh, anyway, so good. Yeah. Anyway, that was a, that one. I was just reminded of that one only because a couple of weeks ago we, we hit the anniversary of his passing. Oh, so you really were a big fan. Yes, and I'm a fan of his brothers too. His brother um, writes operas. Interesting. And so a big, talented family, so I've been following his brother for quite a while as well. So we'll yeah. have to look into that. I'm a theater person. Yes. So, right, so I mean, huge fan of his brother Jerry died as well. But yeah, so I always remember, I think January 11th, 12th or something. And I was like, oh, but then I'm like, maybe yeah, they're not asking about sleeping bag. <laughs> then? <laughs> I would climb inside my sleeping bag, yeah. <laughs> it, was the, it was a lot more innocent than that. I mean, there was no of him climbing in my sleeping bag. No! That did not happen. It was an adventure. It was an adventure. It was an adventure story. Do we have any audience questions for Ms. Heather? I know it's a surprise, but you can't have any. Okay. What did you think when you first saw the script for A New Nightmare? What was your take on that? Well, because I, I mean, I thought it was really dark. And the first draft that I read, the whole stalker, like stalking Nancy, that was a much stronger part of the storyline. And um, it was, it was a lot darker in like a lot of different ways that I remember thinking to myself, I don't, I don't think people are going to like this as much, you know. Um, and I didn't think people were going to buy that I was playing the Heather Langenkamp. And then I was like, oh my god, how am I going to ask my husband if he like minds if I play myself in a movie? And then I'm like, and how am I going to tell my dad and my mom like I'm going to play Heather Langenkamp? 
and our name's going to be out there like that. And, and also, the person playing your husband wasn't your husband either. The person playing my husband, and you know, and he's, but he's playing David. So I had all these things that immediately occurred to me. Like, I had to be a politician, kind of like, and smooth over all of these relatives of mine and my husband. And, and, and so it, my first reaction was, I don't know. I just don't know if, and, and Wes hadn't made a movie in a while, and his reputation had kind of fallen a little bit. I mean, he wasn't in the prime of his career anymore. Um, and I didn't know if he was gonna be able to pull it off. And that was my not having faith in Wes. But then I, and then I, you know, talked to Wes and he was like, I really want you to do it and it's gonna be, you know, it, this idea is it's gonna be something that's never been done before. And he kind of convinced me how great, great it was actually. And, and then I said, well, if I do it, I want to make the same money that Robert makes. And um, that was just a total non-starter. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was a time when I just thought. You were trying to get fired. OK, okay. You started. No, but I was like, if I have to give my name to this character, and I have to be Heather Langenkamp forever in this movie, I was like, I really felt that we should have favored nations, is what they, what they call it. And everybody makes the same, or you know, the same deal, pretty much. And of course, New Line Cinema just thought I was being absolutely ridiculous. And they, and I, and then I said to my representative, I said, "But who else are they going to get? Like, if this isn't the one moment where you can stand up and say this is what I want, or you know, I'm walking, basically, then I can never do that for the rest of my career. So I might as well try it, you know." And um, it didn't go anywhere, and, and in fact, Wes called me and says, well, they're passing. And um, I said, are you kidding me? Who are they gonna get to play Heather? And he's like, they'll find somebody. And then I realized that they were totally bluffing. But because if they were willing to pass with that demand, I decided, okay, you tell me, you know, what is, what is it worth to you? And it was like, hardly anything. So my, my ego was really bruised, actually, after that whole thing. And so I entered the project. I mean, I was very happy to have the job, obviously, and I really wanted to do it. And I wanted to work with Wes again, and I thought the idea was so good. But I was a little bit, I entered the project with a little bit of hurt feelings and the sense of, if you can't, you know, if you can't ask for what you think you deserve when the, when you're playing yourself with your name in this big franchise that's making a lot of money, then I'll never be able to. And that's kind of how I felt about it. But once we started shooting and I, you know, got over my hurt feelings, it was a wonderful experience. And of course, New Line Cinema did have a lot of money, and so we got treated really well. And you know, the costumes were nice, and so it was fine. But I mean, it's just a really good example of, as a woman in Hollywood. Even then, it wasn't possible to, like, you know, push for a negotiation that I thought was fair. And it's just been one of the problems with Hollywood, you know, even today. So, I mean, look what happened with uh, Nat Campbell on screen. And that was a perfect example exactly. too. Exactly, and I'm so proud that she. I, she's so nice. gutsy. I know. And you know, she, okay. And now actually, someone who built the franchise, she is the Robert England of that franchise. Yeah. yeah. Pay the woman. Yeah, and it's really funny because they don't have a qualm about offending a woman in that situation. But I just cannot even imagine a scenario where they would offend any of the other, you know, the, the monster characters or the Robert England type characters. And then that's just a, it's just the way it is. So all you women out there. Don't be discouraged. Yeah. It's a hard, you know, it's a very tough road, no matter what career you have. And and it's just a legacy. Like, so many people complain about the injustices of the past, and this is nothing like, say, you know, what other people are dealing with in their lives. But I do have a tiny little sense of that sense of injustice that you feel like, um, you know, you were just born into this body, and you're just you know, a woman, and the other people are born into other bodies that just don't have the same value in this in this world. But I can't, you know, I, other people have so many other different kinds of struggles. I don't compare myself, but I do empathize because I, for one, 
you know, year, I kind of really was like, God, I just can't believe that this is the way it is. I can't believe it either. But I mean, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, we've all, we've all, you know, it's hard to be a woman in Hollywood. I don't know why I picked that place. <laughs> you know, I really, I don't know why. Well, I mean, because you had to do it. Well, because I wanted to so badly. Yeah. You felt it. In your and you're willing to give it all. You're willing to do whatever it takes. That's the truth. And mm -hmm. and 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 you know, a lot of people are in a lot worse um, situations back in the '80s. At that time, mm -hmm. women had to, you know, they subjected themselves to other types of humiliations to get parts. Or and you know, you hear a lot about them now because 40 years later, we're realizing like just how twisted and messed up that was. At the time, believe me, a lot of you know people that I knew were, you know, compromising their values or doing things that they knew they were going to regret the next day, or you know, deciding to not um, stand on ceremony. And and now we, you know, I, I, I in fact I talked about it with um, James Janice the other day as we were. He has a podcast now called Screams and Nightmares or something like that. Have you? You don't notice things that I did last week. <laughs> I'm not a stalker. I just like a sleeping bag. <laughs> and then there's yeah, a podcast. Here again. Barbara Crampton produces it, and um, Catherine from Terrifier. Catherine. Yes, or she's Parker. Parker. Uh, whatever her last name. Parker. She's the other Parker. host with James Denise, and we talk about nightmares that we've really had in real life. And it's a cute show. It's a YouTube. Uh, show okay, and uh, but we were talking in, and, and I talked about a moment in Nightmare Seven when that tongue is wrapped around my head at the very last scene, and for some reason that scene has stuck with me in my subconscious mind, not so much today, but for about ten years after we did that, and it made me feel so bad about myself, and um, because there was just some imagery in it that I did not care for, and when we shot this scene, a lot of the men on the set were kind of making jokes about this, the tongue and wrapping uh, around my head, and, you know, they, they happen to use KY jelly to make all those things look shiny on, on screen, so like, you know, more KY, and, you know, it was just a jokey, kind of funny, everyone's having a great time, and kind of more humiliating. But for me, it, I, my brain was accepting all that input as embarrassing and humiliating and I didn't like to be in that position and um, I told Greg Nicotero who was supposed to be here he made all those special effects I told him last month the last time I saw him you know I had a lot of nightmares about that day He's like you did I said yeah I felt really humiliated by you know just that whole situation where you guys are wrapping that thing around my head and making jokes and and um, Oh my gosh, I had no idea. I said, why would you know? I wouldn't have said anything. And he said, yeah, we do things like that to actresses all the time. <laughs> like, that could be interpreted as humiliating, you know? And, and, and he's like, and I never stopped to, to think about that. And I said, well, maybe now, going forward, because you're making stuff for women all the time, like maybe you could pull them aside and say, we're gonna do this to you, we're gonna wrap this tongue around your head, and we're gonna slather it in KY jelly, and like, do you have any problems with that? And you know, you could just be a little bit more sensitive about, about the imagery. No, about and, no jokes. You know, or, or, you know <laughs> well, maybe, I don't mind the jokes, but it was just not, I didn't know it was gonna affect me like that, frankly. I went home that night, I was like, ugh, I'm so glad that day is over. And then I would have nightmares about it, and then I would have to be like, talking about it to my husband, or, he caught me sleepwalking, like trying to pull the tongues off of my face. And and so you don't know what's gonna hit you like that in your life. Like you can just you can just think something is an app, just an event, but then it will linger and, and then you feel like, why did that linger? And you know, it just touched a nerve, you know, it literally, you know, touched a nerve in your in your psyche that you don't know anything about until it happens to you. And, and then Catherine, she's like, you know, that happened to me, but it was in a different situation. Maybe it was on Terrifier. But I felt like I wasn't being respected, and I was like wearing nothing, you know, and you're in a very vulnerable 
position. So I was glad that we talked about it because I think that when we talk about it then, other people who are in the situation where you have to handle other people's feelings and other people's emotions, like to take uh, to take care of that, you know, it's a big responsibility and and actresses often have to be in really vulnerable situations. I worked on a movie last year with Taylor Compton Smith. That's her last name. Yeah, I mean Scout yeah. Taylor Compton. <laughs> You don't have to get that back. It's three names. Scow, Taylor Compton, and I play this witch, and I've always wanted to play a witch, and the movie's called Stalked. And when I come in, she's laying on the table, and her hands are tied up above her head, and her ankles are tied down, and and she's, you know, in, in I mean, she's probably in pain in real life, but she's also just imagining, you know, pretending, acting. Um, and I just immediately felt so sorry for her. Like, I was like, I'm so glad I'm not you, and I'm so glad I'm the bad guy in this scene, and I'm not your your character. Because I realized, like, it's so hard to be that woman who has to be, you know, by the victim, bound, gagged. It was, and I thought, that's the exact same situation where I wouldn't be surprised if she felt, like, really crappy that night. One more time for those who missed it. What's that podcast called? So we can go. It's up. called something like Screen Dreams. Screen Dreams. Screen, Screen Dreams. Dreams. It just started, and I know the day that I went, they had Mike Flanagan, and then Barbara is kind of is like, she kind of like appears in the middle of the show, and she offers like a little game. It's a super cute show, Aww, and cool. um, yeah, so it just started. Awesome. Yeah, it's really cute. A lot of the podcasts, horror podcasts, are really really fun to listen to, right? Yeah, I have one myself. Yes, you do. So, now I got this gig. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, in our podcast, we break down a movie by segment. Favorite kill, end of line. Yes. We got best hair, we got a fashion moment. So oh, nice. So tell me, in uh, any of your nightmare movies, do you have a specific fashion moment? Doesn't have to be your own either. Well, I mean, <laughs> My favorite fashion moment in Nightmare on Elm Street, one, is when Johnny Depp is answering the phone in his bedroom when he's wearing that like midriff uh, yeah. and those sweatpants and you get to see, oh, <laughs> I saw the movie last night, I'm like, he's so gorgeous. That's my favorite fashion in all of Nightmare on Elm Street. In Nightmare 3, all of my fashion was so hideously ugly that I hated all of it. So there's one blouse I wore that was like a purple color that I just thought was the prettiest color. That was the only thing I liked about <laughs> that. But you know, that movie, because all the kids were, um, you know, in the mental hospital, they, they didn't get to wear kind of like the teenager clothes that most horror movies, teenagers have really cute outfits like Nightmare 4. Like all the kids wear such cool outfits and, um, but Nightmare 3, it was really subdued in terms of the fashion. Honestly, it's more realistic. It's more, it's more realistic, you know, yeah. I wasn't wearing, I wasn't wearing all the trendy stuff you no, see on no. TV when I was in high school age, right? And that kind of just started, I think, in the 80s, the 90s when you see horror movies where everyone looks so fabulous. Well, they look fabulous in part four as well, you know, but I mean, my friends who lived there in that yeah. time period in high school were like, you know, that's the Yeah, that was like the late 80s, right? Right. So, yeah, and the Nightmare 7, I think my favorite fashion of them. Mm. Yes. Mm. Well, I wore this like leather vest that's like a, had a lot of pockets. Mm -hmm. It was a Banana yeah. Republic vest. I still have it. Oh. And it's, I would wear it even today. You should do it's an so in-costume nice. photo of that and a shirt. You should. That, I would do that because they've asked me to like wear a costume and I won't wear a pajamas in a photo op. I just feel like that's too informal and it's, I don't know, it's too creepy. But I could wear that. But that's from Nightmare 7 and people don't love that as much as. They don't. Um, but it's still, it's in the costume of the franchise. Okay, I think I'll go dig it out. I love Nightmare I don't think it would fit, but I could, maybe I, I could go take it. it. No, I don't think it would. You can see who the real fans are if they notice it. Yeah, and I just wore a denim shirt under it, and I think I was wearing brown, um, like just brown pants. So yeah. it's easy to recreate that. No one's ever cosplayed it as far as I can see. Oh, yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. We know. <laughs> yeah, we know. Deandra 
<laughs> one more. She has your Irish friend. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. She wears that, too. She wore that one. Yeah. I have some really amazing cosplayer uh, friends who always surprise me with their beautiful costumes. I've never had the courage to cosplay. I've always been that. that How many of you have ever cosplayed a character from your favorite movie? I've I've always been that person who was afraid to dress up for Halloween because really? what if I'm the only one dressed up? You know, oh, scenario. That's too bad. I've always I would I would dress up, but but I was always afraid, almost like it's severe anxiety. Going it's to I mean, it is it's it's or going to work. Yeah, or going to work even. You know, like, you want to dress up at work, you know, you really tell us to dress up, stuff like that. So I think cosplaying is kind of the same situation. You just keep it in your car, and if everyone's dressed up, you can go be in it and get the show up. <laughs> we don't have a car. Okay, you put it in your backpack, right. and then if everyone's in costume, then you go to the bathroom, right. and then you got to do it. Yeah, so I've always had that like, anxiety of what if I'm the only one I don't want to stand out in school and in adulthood, right? And so it's kind of the same like at these cons, and I love the costumes, I, I love looking at them. And I have great admiration, but I just can't. I can't. I can't. Wow, that's amazing. I can't. Yeah. But you were always my favorite. Um, oh, thanks. Person as a young, young lady. Because I thought you were the most pretty, <laughs> most beautiful person ever. And I wanted to, we have matching hair. <laughs> and I, and no one has to buy it. This humid Atlanta I know. Right, rain is not good for our hair. My hair was this tall last night before I saw you. I was actually talking to Andras last night, yes. and I was like, he's like, what's going on? My hair is too tall. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And I sent him a picture, and he said, it's like the 80s, and I know. <laughs> well, does anybody else have a question? Because I like, probably... Yeah, you got, you got, you got five on. minutes. How is that? Okay, good. I have more time than I thought. Five minutes. Anyone else? Or I'm going to Really? Okay. How about you, Australia? It's Friday. I did have one, but you can't already answer it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I guess maybe, yeah, because um, I listened to the podcast, um, and as I was listening to it the other day, um, I was thinking about the fact that, like, nowadays, sets have this newer role of, like, intimacy coordinators for scenes yes. that are of sexual nature. Do you think if that was around in the 90s, that might have helped maybe. on New Nightmare? And yeah, what? I don't think anybody would have thought that this was a scene that would have required an intimacy coordinator. But on Midnight Club... That was the first time I actually met an intimacy coordinator because we did have some of the some of the um, actors had scenes together where they um, and so what it does I mean for Nightmare on Elm Street Part One when I kissed Johnny like they would have come in probably and they would have discussed like where your hands could go and not go and how are you going to plan to do this kiss and I think it would have just taken all the joy out of it frankly <laughs> but it for a lot of people it's not joyful at all, you know, it's very stress inducing. So it's such a good question because it just shows you how things have evolved. And actually I do have an actor friend who, despite all the coordinating with the intimacy coordinator, the actor still didn't get the message and was very inappropriate and she felt very threatened and he ended up getting fired, wow. you know? So now if it goes, if people aren't being as professional as they possibly can, it can, you can get fired, and and it's it's really tough. I hope I never have to do intimacy on screen. <laughs> I mean, I've gotten so scared of it. Like, I don't know that I, I don't know. I'm sure there'll be a, a moment when it will happen, and I'll have to just face it, face the music. Yeah. <laughs> it's so not fun though. Like you're wearing garments to hide your parts, and then you you know the set is closed, and then everybody's shouting, "Close set!" You know, it's so loud. And the director's embarrassed, and Wes Griffin was so embarrassed that I had to kiss Johnny Depp, and, and he just didn't even want to look. He's like, okay, action. No. And then <laughs> he was just mortified, he, you know, but he knew that it had to be part of the story, and he never talked to us about it. Which is, <laughs> it never happened. It was like it never happened. You know, Wes is so modest. And I did see a question somewhere back here. Someone's hand shot up for one final, yes, one final question. Well, I watched the movie last night um, on a big screen for the first time in a long time. And I was just so amazed at her determination 
to just figure it out. Like, it wasn't even about getting Freddie or finding Freddie in the beginning. It was about trying to understand, like, what is going on? And then, so she learns from Tina that they're sharing the same dream, and then she hears it from Rod, and then she hears it from Glenn, and then, you know, it, it finally kind of starts to dawn on her, like, we're all having this dream, and then she goes to the sleep center, gets the hat out of her dream. And at the time, you know, we're shooting it out of sequence, so I wasn't sure whether I was able to, to properly carry the suspense to make it bigger and bigger. But what I really loved about Nancy watching her yesterday was that nothing, like, nothing's gonna stop her from getting the answer. And, um, and when she does have the answer, she just knows what she has to do. She just has to go get him. And um, there's never, and I, and I asked Wes, I said, was she fearless? He's like, no, she was not fearless. She, was, she had fear like everybody else, but she just was so determined. And, um, and I think that's really great because you don't have to be fearless to be strong. You have to know that you're you know, scared out of your mind and you have to just keep going and face it. And that's, you know, the motto, you know, face it, you just have to face it. And it's become my motto because I love Nancy so much. <laughs> In fact, one of my fans told me that line, she's like, you just have to face it. This gal, if you ever see my documentary, it's called I Am Nancy, but this one woman who lost her, her, her leg, both legs or one leg, um, her name is Jude. She was in the hospital for many, many, many weeks. And she watched Nightmare on Elm Street every day. And I asked her, I said, why, why that movie? Like, what did that movie speak to you? How did it speak to you? And she says, you just have to face it. And I just could just think about this little girl in the hospital with her leg cut off. And that's, that's her motto, is you just have to face it. And I've used it a million times in my own life. You know, when you just want to run away, you just want to, like, get back in bed and pull the covers over your head. Just face it, just get through it. And it's never as bad as you think it's gonna be. I mean, that's the truth. Yeah, I mean, I can, I, I saw that. And I also yeah. related to you because I had some hospital nightmare on street stories as well. Yeah, I mean, anyone who's been in a hospital, I mean, it's so grim. Yeah, yeah, and when I was finally allowed to watch TV or consume any sort of media, I went, of course, for my nightmares one and uh, three. And well, I'm glad that she's inspiring. I always feel like, yeah, the, the idea of not taking care of this is just not there. She just, she really has to know. There's so, no other option. Yeah, that's my favorite part of Nancy. Everyone, please give it up. Yeah.